So tonight, the subject matter or the title of the lesson is uh, Installing and Configuring Networking Capabilities. What we're going to do is to uh, add some capabilities, add some devices, some things, some stuff uh, to the network. The first one is configure uh, Windows proxy and firewall settings. Uh, install and configure Soho networks. There is in the share that you can practice with. Let me bring it over if I can get to it. In the, this is this is the folder that's shared. If you go into Labs. Uh, Soho Simulator, there is a list of simulators. The one that is in the book that, work, that seemed to work pretty well is this one here. Let me just copy. I'm going to keep this open. I want to copy it. We'll take a look at one of those when we get to it. Uh, and then troubleshoot wired and wireless networks, the objectives. Proxy settings. A proxy server, if you use a proxy or a proxy of any kind is something or somebody that does something for you. So what a proxy server does is does something for us. What it does, and I got to get this pen going here, you know, how that is that I can't do it without the pen. What we do is we have a www server. This is out on the internet. We have a proxy server here. What we do, and I'll show you the configurations here in just a second is we have a computer here that's on our internal network. Instead of going out to directly to the www server, whatever it is, LeaderQuest, Yahoo, Google, uh, Microsoft, Cisco, we go, we send our request to the proxy server. The proxy server then rebuilds the request and it sends it to the uh, server that we're trying to get to. Couple of advantages from a networking standpoint, we can control who gets on this proxy server by forcing logons, depending on how we configure it. We can limit the time of day that people can use the proxy server. We can limit the sites that an individual can go to through the proxy server. We can go back and look at the proxy server and see where they've been. When they say, oh, I didn't go to that porn site, say, well, here it is. It's your IP address, and here's where you went kind of deal. This is one I used these with when my son was a teenager because those of you who remember being teenage boys, I don't, or have teenage boys or been around teenage boys, know what their tendencies are. Uh, a couple of things that it allowed me to do is I could shut him down at 11 o'clock so that he had to uh, uh, get ready. Jameer says very true. I shut him down at 11 o'clock so that he didn't have anything to do. So he'd go to bed, get some rest before he went to school the next day. Uh, I could see where he had been. So we could control, we could limit what happens here. Uh, the predominant proxy server is going to be HTTP. There are a number of free ones out there. Uh, that you can get if you want to run it at home uh, when you do these things. Uh, we can specify the correct address. And this is, these are the things when we got to configure. Configure exceptions including ranges. Include HTTP and FTP connections. Uh, we use a proxy server religiously at eCPI so that we could do the limitations. Uh, one of the problems with it is is you you can filter uh, uh, character strings but if you had something like so Sussex Sussex County Sussex County and you figured and you uh, filtered the character string sex that's part of the character string so it would filter that you have to be careful the way you construct the filters on these things but let me see if we can show what the configurations are here. And I think this is maybe one of the labs do this. We're gonna we'll go to internet options. And in the internet options here, we'll go to connections. 
and under connections go to LAN local area networks LAN settings automatically detect settings uh, use a script it can be scripted but what we're typically going to do is go down here put in a proxy server we'll put in the address of our proxy server you do want to bypass it for local addresses otherwise the proxy server typically sits at the edge of the network and goes to the internet so it's sitting at the edge of the network going to the internet trying to find your local address can't find it so we want to do that the slide says to also do uh, if we go to advanced and, and we click on advanced here we can do something other than HTTP so we have HTTP the proxy address and the port number that we're going to use uh, there the secure HTTPS FTP and then a SOX server uh, if we need it uh, when we do these things so this, this is the configuration that you set up on each machine and if you're in an enterprise you would do it with a policy in the Active Directory for a Windows system but that that is the uh, configuration to uh, set set up the uh, the proxy server itself, and, and when we do say, let's go back to this. The addresses here would be the address of the proxy server. We used a a, a Linux one, which is a, it's called Squid, and its port was 3389. So instead of using port 80 here, we would use port 3389. You have to know which port to contact the proxy server on uh, in order to make this configuration work. So this configure HTTP FTP connections on it, so we can we can manage things there. The Windows firewall. Take a look at it, or try to. The Windows firewall. And mine's got some uh, configurations and some unconfigurations on this. When we look at it, we have inbound rules and outbound rules. Uh, the Bonjour service, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, Apple, uh, an iPad or what, I don't know, it's a, anyway, it's, it's an Apple, one of the Apple services. I have Dropbox. Dynamips here is for a simulator that runs on my computer, but it actually has to get through the firewall, uh, to, to get there. EaseUS is a, is a backup software. FileZilla is for uploading and downloading an FTP client that allows me to uh, upload and download it uh, things on this website that I manage or that I help with I don't really manage it but it tells me where the program is and then we'll go to the protocols and ports UDP local port and it, it's it is allowed to use all ports uh, on this thing and, and this is what when you install something that says okay do you want to allow this thing to uh, happen then you would uh, uh, say yes the application is going to allow uh, the software to punch a hole in the firewall and that's basically what these things are and then outbound rules it says there are no we have a whole bunch of Microsoft uh, storage 3d builder uh, uh, captive portal flow you can look and see what is available outbound that uh, firewall typically will they're called stateful as you make a connection going out of the firewall it will create what's called a state table and when a connection comes back in it then checks to see if you if you created the connection if it if it is if you did it allows you back in otherwise it blocks that particular uh, uh, conversation but uh, enabling and disabling port security is in the in Windows firewall settings I didn't I didn't look at that well we, we can look at that and get back to it so we go here connection security rules when we do this we can enable here we go enable or disable whatever we want I've got Windows Defender firewall is on inbound connections that do not match a rule are blocked outbound connections that do not match a rule are allowed because what that means is I'm allowing 
everything to go out on this machine uh, for the for the private profile for the public profile we've got the same thing uh, public profile is if you're on a public network you're at the Starbucks or whatever else but we can uh, do what we want to allow what we don't want to allow in and out of our machine on a network you're going to have a, a larger firewall that protects the entire network so what one looks like enable disable port security filters inbound and outbound traffic we have rules and exceptions things that we're going to permit things that we're going to deny uh, there is logging reporting and logging activity if something violates the rule then we should get a, a an activity a, a notification of something happened on it uh, protection against uh, spyware firewalls uh, spyware and malware uh, blocks pop-ups assigns ports we can configure uh, port forwarding and port triggering we'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute uh, enable or disable the windows firewall uh, when you have a network firewall there's always some discussion as do you need the firewall on the individual machines and the answer is when you start managing the network that's going to be up to you theoretically everything's going to be blocked by the network firewall <clears throat> but if something gets into the network the individual machine firewalls will then be another step defense in depth is a term that you'll hear as you go through uh, uh, IT classes and as you as you go through being an IT professional but that's just part of the defense in depth if you have them enabled some people do and some people don't this is the proxy server and this is another one that I kind of got the uh, uh, got it in the wrong place but the school PC the firewall allowed proxy request goes to the proxy server the proxy server then rebuilds and sends it to the uh, website advantage here we can filter we can check for viruses uh, those things are all advantages to proxy servers uh, students didn't like it because they were limited where they could go to they couldn't go to all the sites that they were used to the windows firewall settings we just uh, looked at here the, the firewall states on incoming connections uh, active uh, home and network not connected we're connected to a domain network uh, what are we doing what do we allow we can turn the firewall on and off in here and again your choice uh, as you can see from mine I've, ch I've chosen to leave it on uh, sometimes some machines I turn it off uh, just for certain actions uh, sometimes when you're doing certain actions you have to turn it off because it blocks some activities that you may want to do uh, when you're in these things. In the networking world, we have we have the internal network, and this is the private network or the protected network. This is the one where we have our mail server, database server. This is where our users operate. So this is our internal network, and then we have an internal firewall. And we have two firewalls here, an internal and an external, and we show a router here. We actually used a filter router. We used a firewall and a filter router in order to do this. Similar, same thing that's going to happen here. A DMZ, demilitarized zone term you've heard. What we have in here are uh, specific servers, maybe like a web server, that we want everybody to be able to get to. So in the filtering, we would allow everybody we'll say all to get to port 80 and maybe 443 the two web ports the uh, uh, non the HTTP and the HTTPS ports uh, we might have a mail server down here that we would allow uh, people to get to we would have a rule in the firewall that anybody can get to IP address uh, 193.12.6.1 on port 80 and port 443 and we might have one down here that they could get to 193.126.6.2 and the mail ports are going to be 25 that's SMTP simple mail transfer for protocol which is 
the one we used is send mail 110 pop post office protocol which downloads on your machine and 143 is IMAP which you read the mail on the server and, and 143 is when you're doing administrator this is the one that you want to do because then you can make backups you can keep copies of the email uh, 110 is downloaded from the server onto the uh, local machine can be an issue but we have rules here firewall rules that allow users onto the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, because we would like people to get there. If we're selling something here on this web server, it'd be really nice if people could buy it. The internal firewall uh, basically is a do not enter sign. It, it rejects all, uh, since there are no resources that anybody needs to get in from externally, it rejects all attempts to create a session from the outside. The state full firewall, state full, as I make a connection going through here, then my connection gets listed in the state table. So I go out here to a web server or whatever, and then, I, then it comes back. The firewall checks the state table and says, yep, I created that connection so it allows it the answer to come back to me but the DMZ the militarized zone is a filtered area where we allow anybody to get to a limited number of services uh, internal network protected network private network we want to keep everybody out from the outside and this is DMZ this this is a, a I uh, kind of what probably would have been better than me doing the drawings, but we have the uh, do some more sketching here, more more dragging around. We have a net router, we have a firewall, state full firewall that we talked about, uh, packet filter up here. So from the internet, uh, a switch here, intrusion detection system, all sorts of things working on it with the proxy server out here. So if this guy was going somewhere, we would come over here into the DMZ and that's probably where the proxy server should be rather than internally to so the proxy server requesting something and then the proxy server is going to go out to the internet to get that information the answer will come back to the proxy server it will then rebuild it and send it to our private IP address firewall here we just have to allow access to the proxy server going out and since it's state full it will allow the answers to come back in and here in the DMZ we have everything web server email server FTP server sitting here uh, things that we would like anybody out here on the internet to be able to get to so that they can buy stuff on our web server NAT is a process that is, it's it's called a security and it is a security process. We have a NAT device which is going to be a router or a firewall. What NAT stands for is network address, network address translation. And then we talked last night, we had private IP addresses. 192.168 was a private address. These aren't routable on the internet. So what we can do and what in addition to being a security device it has been a device to extend the usability of the IPv4 address space what we have is a public address or a group of public addresses here and we have the NAT device when a private IP address comes up 192.168.12.20 it NATs it does an address translation to a public IP address and we got we have a we'll say we have 24.96.83 and we'll say we have 121 let's say we have this address and we have 121 through 150 would be in a pool and it would be a dynamic net uh, so that when this guy comes up he gets an IP address goes out gets the information comes back gives up the address the next guy may get the same may get a different one that is NAT. True NAT is a one-to-one, -one, because I'm going to talk about another one here in just a second. One-to-one -one 
private to public. You and I use a process at home called PAT, Port Address Translation, where we have a single IP address. And we talked about ports last night. We went from zero to 65,535. Uh, so what PAT does is we have our private IP address, or private IP address on my computer, but we're communicating with each other. When it comes up to my router, my router uses its public IP address, and I have a grand total of one, so it uses its public IP address and then a port number, and that creates the socket. I can then go to the internet to get the information, it comes back to the router. The router keeps this information in the table and sends it back to the originating IP address. So two different ways to translate private to public addresses. NAT, which actually gets an IP address, a public IP address, and PAT, which gets a, an IP address and a port number. We only use a single in the port address translation. We have one. In a uh, network address translation, we have multiples. You can run a whole significant network on port address translation. That was the other advantage of the proxy server, too. We only really needed one address, depending on how big it is and how much the proxy server can do, because everybody goes through the proxy server. And, and that's the way they get to the Internet uh, in order to do their thing here, there. So DNAT, dynamic NAT, uh, this is the internal and, and the external. Uh, and, and down here it says, well, this says DNAT, dynamic NAT, down here it says static NAT. Static NAT would be if we had a, oh, well, let's say we had a, uh, a web server sitting someplace, and then we were uh, trying to uh, get the uh, attendance updated here. If we had a, so let's talk about static net. We have a device here and we would, uh, we, we would then have an IP address out here on it, a public IP address. And then we would have back here maybe have our web server and it would have a private IP address. So what it would do here is we would go to, and we'll pick one of these here, 211.14.248.68 would be listed in DNS. We talked about DNS last night. The uh, service that we can type in a name and it gets us an IP address. When we got to this IP address, the NAT device would say, oh, that's a NATed address. I want to send it to 192.168.25.101. So we can have devices on our private network that are accessed from the public network. Uh, dynamic NAT is one where we use the pool that as they come in, you, you grab a, a public address, go to the internet, when you come back, you drop the public address back into the pool, the NAT pool, the address pool, so that the next user uh, can use it. It's kind of like these, uh, I guess maybe these scooters that people are, are leaving out that you use it for a while and then you put it back into the pool, somebody else can use it. Rental cars, whatever else. Internal addresses, external addresses, this is the address pool over here that I was talking about. A number of goes through, goes into here, picks up a public address, goes to the internet with the public address. When it comes back, it drops that public address back into the pool and the answer goes back to the uh, private address. The static NAT over here are actually one-to-one -one associations. You would want those for things like a web server because if it were using a pooled address, then you'd never know what its public address was. Uh, so we have uh, dynamic NAT, gets it out of the pool, static NAT one-to-one, -one, and then PAT, port address translation, where we use a single IP address and, the, and ports in order to uh, get to the Internet with our private IP addresses. Soho, small office, 
home office connectivity, uh, resource sharing on a small scale, up to 20 computers, wired and wireless connections, the same physical location uh, typically is what that's going to be. There can be some basic quality of service, and I said what we would do when we got to this. Look at one of these things, and I forgot which one it said to use. But when you go to that link, look in here, you, you can use a simulator for a whole bunch of different machines in here. We'll just pick one, and I have no idea what it's going to look like. Access router. These things do have, there's a lot of different ones, and the book tells you which one that, that they want you to use, and it's not any of these. But you can practice with, play with a number of them, at least this one has a password on it. So we can get in here, uh, this device, uh, router, internet, we're connected, it gives us a network status. The number of devices that are online, we could add a device. Parental controls here. We have external storage, uh, home networking, guest access, which is basically what guest access does is allows users to uh, use our internet, but they can't get to the uh, internal uh, network in order to uh, to do things. Uh, see device list, speed test, connectivity probably just going to look at mine here a minute. The network password, uh, uh, the, the sorts of things that you have there. Actually, I think what I want to do, since I kind of know how to get around in my... This is not a true Soho device, but it's kind of close. It has We have the router settings here that we can configure. We talked about DHCP. The Soho router will be will be the DHCP server. Uh, the IP address, hostname IP address, subnet mask, class C network, uh, the I, IP address of this router. Uh, one, so I thought it was 11, 192.168.1.1, which is kind of customary to use the dot one address uh, for the default gateway. DHCP is on. I have a pool. I start at the 20 address and I go to the 254. I give a lease time of one week on these things. We could have reserved addresses if we had something that we wanted to always get the same address. Go back to here. Uh, let's see, access control. This is where we have port forwarding and port triggering. Uh, parental control, if we wanted to uh, to control something, URL filtering is available in here at an address, restrictions on the website. Uh, DMZ, if I wanted to configure a DMZ in this thing, we could activate it. Uh, it's not on because I don't use a DMZ. Firewall is on, uh, and you have different levels that you can uh, uh, set with it. And then the land to WAN allow all WAN to LAN uh, block certain ports. And this is not as robust as the one we looked at for uh, Windows. We can go into custom and, and do specific ones. Respond to ping. Actually, I think I want to turn that off because what that's saying is that it will respond to a ping. And, and then somebody that's trying to uh, infiltrate could uh, uh, then know that this was a live system. So we have those, the devices that are on it, uh, our internet connectivity, IPv4 and IPv6. Said last night, this one does support IPv6. What they do is give you a, uh, a, LAN, a, a delegated prefix. They give you a, a network address and then uh, it assigns the, uh, the public addresses for it. But just a quick look. When you're preparing for this test, use some of the simulators in order to practice the things that you're going uh, to be doing on the that they're going. I'm sure they're going to ask you on the on the uh, test. So, 
quality of service is something that allows us to assign a higher priority to certain traffic than other traffic. Uh, we might, for instance, say that uh, phone calls, voice over IP, have a higher priority than games than certain ports. So we can assign a bandwidth, CPU usage, different things. And the picture I put up here is like uh, quality of service, the carpool lane, if you can get into it, yeah, it's going to be uh, a quality of service because it's not going to have as much uh, of, a, of an issue with it. The, uh, there is a thing called a service level agreement uh, between the ISP and the subscriber, the business, that guarantees you a certain level of service. So those things and quality of service allows us to uh, prioritize traffic within our network. Uh, these uh, devices do that. I had one one time that said you can do that and it prioritized streaming. What it really did was reserve a certain amount of bandwidth for streaming and then that limited the bandwidth for everything else. So when you start doing quality of service you have to be careful about how you actually do the configuration of them. This is from a, a different presentation, but what is quality of service? The ability of the network to offer improved service to specific types of network traffic. Uh, defined by a set of parameters that controls the service provided, prioritizes traffic based on importance, and uses congestion avoidance methods. And you don't have to know what those are, just that it avoids congestion. Maybe like, well, you probably avoid congestion. Maybe you'll use ways uh, to get around when you're driving for, uh, to work. Uh, and, and it will tell you, don't go here, go here kind of thing. So similar concept, uh, different methods, but similar concept of what we're doing with quality of service. Uh, the common uh, parameters, bandwidth, and they're over there on the left, what they are, bandwidth, jitter, latency, packet loss. Bandwidth is the number of bits. Latency is delay, the time difference between the transmission of a signal and its receipt delay. Jitter is when we have an inconsistent latency and that's when you get uh, audio that you can't understand, what I call the wah-wah effect. And then packet loss, the number of packets uh, that are damaged uh, during the transmission of, of them, of, of the packets. We're at Okay, we'll go ahead and continue here with wireless. There are two different ways to connect devices together wirelessly. The first is infrastructure mode, and, and the image down there on the right, a little bit out of focus, try to make it big enough to see. Uh, in the infrastructure, the devices can communicate with each other through an access point. Could be just an access point or a, uh, a wireless router. The difference is an access point only allows the devices to communicate with each other and the wired network. It doesn't route to the internet. The wireless router has a WAN port on it as well as LAN port. So infrastructure communicate with other devices uh, first going through an access point can communicate with each other or can communicate with uh, a wired network and eventually we have to, if we're going to have our wireless devices communicate with the, with the servers and the other devices that are wired to the network, we go through an access point and then the wire goes back to uh, the, the wired network. Ad hoc mode is the wireless devices communicate directly with each other. There's no access point. Uh, operating an ad hoc allows all wireless devices within range of each other to discover and communicate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion much uh, like and I'll use a term that we kind of mentioned last night uh, the NetBIOS or the NetBuoy protocol did. NetBIOS was a broadcast protocol where everybody saw everybody else. Being in range is going to be one of the requirements. Wireless, we talked about 100 meters for a wired connection we don't really have a, 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 a wired restriction. One of the issues that we get into and, and wireless uses a collision avoidance instead of collision detection. But if we had this device here at the maximum distance and then we had another one over here at the maximum distance, they're communicating with the wireless access point. But these guys never know 
uh, that the other device is around. So the access point is the one that actually controls these things. Being within range, big deal here with the ad hoc mode so that all of the devices know about all of the other devices. Uh, tends to feature a small group of devices in close proximity with each other for ad hoc mode. It's available. I don't know that it's, it may be, but I, 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 I don't, don't know that a lot of people use it. Uh, wireless network types, and this is one that is easy to ask questions about. We're going to start out with 802.11a. I'm going to have a couple of charts with these things. 802.11a and 802.11b uh, were developed at about the same time. They have different frequencies, different char speed characteristics, uh, and different distance capabilities. 802.11 runs at the 5 gigahertz range. It has 54 megabits per second maximum speed. That's in an open room. When we give the speeds on the uh, on wireless, it's real close wide open. It's not at 100 meters away going through three walls. It has a 20 megahertz wide channel and its distance ability, its max is going to be somewhere around 60 feet. It's a high frequency. The higher the frequency, the shorter the distance. Uh, any, any, any of you Navy guys, if you know, uh, submarines use extremely low frequency, ELF is what they call it, extremely low frequency broadcast in order to uh, get from uh, where they are to the sites in the U.S. that can receive their signals. The other type that came about at the same time, and I think this is around 1999, that got another chart that will say that in a minute, is 802.11b. It was 2.4 gigahertz. Its maximum speed was 11 megabits per second. It used a 20 megahertz wide channel. It could go farther. Uh, 802.11a really isn't used very much. It's kind of a specialized one. B1, in spite of the fact that it had the lower speed, it had the longer distance. And I have always heard that one of the reasons that B1 is A, people really liked it, they liked the speed, but they couldn't get the silicone to make the chips for it. So there weren't any of them. 802.11b was upgraded to 802.11g. Uh, it was still 2.4 gig, but the speed increased to 54 megabits per second. So the range is going to be about the same. The 20 megahertz wide channel is going to be the same, but it's going to be faster. One of the issues <clears throat> with the 2.4 gigahertz, gigahertz uh, frequencies is that there's a bunch of other stuff runs on that. Wireless controllers run there. Microwaves run there. Gaming controllers run there. Uh, portable phones run there. Some of them run there. Some of them are, I think, 650K, but some uh, portable phones run at that frequency. 802.11n was the next standard. It was 2.4. Uh, four gig. It, it, it was two, actually it was 2.4 gig and down there the next one and five gig optional features. Uh, so it could actually use both of the frequencies. The the 1172 megabits per second maximum speed per stream, and we could have multiple streams, multiple connections, multiple antennas on these things. It had a uh, process called MIMO or MIMO, M-I-M-O, uh, multiple input, multiple outputs that allowed it to have more than one connection at a time. The optional features, the 5 gig, 150 megabits per second, and it had a 40 megahertz wide channel. The, the channel width is significant because we can put more more information on a wider channel and these things would actually increase the channel width as long as there was no interference. If there was interference it would then reduce the channel width uh, to the standard 20 megahertz. The latest standard that we have 802.11 AC uh, 5 gigahertz 433 megabits maximum speed per stream and I was reading something today that 
you can actually get up to somewhere around six gig on this thing if you have enough streams on it and it uses an 80 megahertz wide channel the MIMO MIMO multiple input multiple output antennas is supported by 802.11n and 802.11ac and that that is one of the things that's really made them faster instead of having the single connection uh, we can have multiple connections with it but we have the one by one one transmit one receive two by two two transmits two receives two by three two transmits three receives three by two three by three and I think the maximum that you can have on the, on these on the end is a uh, is a four by four uh, kind of some of the same information that was in the other slide but 802.11a relatively expensive 54 meg range up to 60 feet not compatible with 11b 11b is the cheapest option that's probably one of the reasons that it it was the most popular option because yeah it wasn't as fast but yeah the internet wasn't that fast then either uh, 11 megabit transfer uh, rate uh, range up to a thousand feet in open areas two to four hundred feet in enclosed spaces not compatible with 11a 11g same basic characteristics as b uh, compatible with 802.11b 2.4 gig 54 megabits per second 11n uh, 600 meg transfer rate and 802.11c uh, 433 meg to 1.3 meg at the uh, 5 5 gigahertz it, and it can use beam farming where it's going to focus the beam uh, on the uh, on the antennas themselves when we talk about channels and this is the 2.4 gig range we have a whole bunch of channels 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 and 14 over here is Europe Europe and Japan we don't use that channel in the US there are really three two channels channels without any overlap and, and hopefully you can see from the colors here that there are overlaps with these things but if we go from 1 6 and 11 those are the true channels if you look at do a, a scan and you can get a, a Wi-Fi finder, finder for your phone that'll show you the uh, other access points that are uh, close to you and what channel they're on. And you want to look at those things and put you as far away as possible. Most of the access points have a auto which is supposed to put you far away but you're going to find that sometimes it doesn't always work that way. Look at those things. And this is a summary slide on the different standards the year adopted 99, 99, 2003, 2009, 2014. The frequencies that we talked about uh, the distances, uh, typical range indoor and typical range outdoor that is available on these things. The next thing that we want to talk about is wireless encryption uh, because wireless radio signal, it's not like we plug in a wire and we go from uh, uh, point A to point B and nobody's there. When we put this wireless signal in the air anybody that's in range can receive it the first attempt at encryption was WEP uh, wireless in I say wireless e equivalency protocol wired equivalency protocol uh, it is not effective don't use WEP it can be cracked and you can find uh, videos on the internet that can crack a weapon in uh, about three minutes uh, if that long at times but we have those it was a 64 bit 128 bit and a 256 bit encryption it was used in 802.11a and b WPA uh, was an interim solution that strengthened basically strengthened the WPA or WEP protocol uh, strong authentication and a data encryptor on it uh, and then the one that is available today that you do want to use is WPA2 uh, strong encryption and authentication uses the advanced encryption uh, uh, system which is the uh, latest approved uh, encryption protocol 
uh, it, it has a EAP as extensible authentication protocol, and it's going to use the uh, the, the TKIP in order to uh, to do this. I got another slide that, that makes it a little bit maybe a little bit better, but we have plain text encryption and an encrypted data. And as we go up in these things, uh, personal and enterprise, enterprise and personal, we have enterprise uh, level encryption that's available which would use a uh, radius server and then you would log in on your network with your username and password but it requires a little bit uh, more a few more resources than does the uh, pre-shared key which is what we typically use on these things that we give everybody the password and they can get onto the uh, onto the wireless network a table of the encryption protocols uh, open, none, anybody can get on. Uh, a lot of open wireless networks. Be careful of them. There's a reason that people give stuff away. Uh, WEP, the encryption was RC4, and we, you have the key links there, and, and then the rules, and then the strength. And I think that what you really know is the strength, very weak, don't use it. It, it has been compromised, it can be cracked in a short period of time. Uh, WPA2 uses TKIP, which is Temporal Key Integrity Protocol down there at the bottom. Uh, it does not reuse the initialization vector. One of the things that happened with WEP was it reused the, uh, the initialization vectors. And when you got two different strings together that did that, you could then crack it uh, when they did those things. I, was watching a movie the, about when they cracked the stuff in World War II, and, and what helped them crack that was a particular operator started all of his messages with Heil Hitler. So you could start out with something that you knew to set in the uh, key set for that day. Up to, uh, let's see, the so key length up to 63. Uh, alphanumeric and punctuation are the rules. WPA is strong if you don't have. WPA2, uh, which is the the newest, the AES 128-bit, uh, very strong encryption, then WPA uh, is the one that you would want to use. More of summaries here. Uh, WPA2, current standard, newer hardware, ensures advanced encryption, uh, doesn't affect performance, also has personal enterprise modes, uh, replaces RC4, TKIP, uh, with, with CCMP and AES algorithm for stronger authentication. But I think what you need to know, WEP, don't use. Uh, should it be used? No. Uh, Wi-Fi, WPA, Wi-Fi protected access. WPA only of WPA2 is not available, and then WPA2 is the one that we want to use. Another chart, lots of charts in here, and you, you can go back and look at them uh, if, if you want to, need to. A uh, little bit different information on each one of them. WEP, uh, encryption method WEP, RC4, uh, data integrity, uh, CRC, cyclical redundancy check, uh, and initial, see, ICV, initial uh, configuration vector, I think is what that is. And then the replay attack protection, no. Replay attack, we we uh, use a password and it's replayed and then can activate it. The other two do have replay protection in them. Wireless access points we talked a little bit about earlier provide connection between wireless devices, enables the wireless networks to connect to the wired network. And in this one, dual band wireless access uh, point here. You notice it doesn't have anything that indicates that it is going to go to the internet, that it has a, a, a WAN connection. So not all wireless access points are wireless routers. They may in fact just be access points. If you want to set up a wireless router as an access point, you can certainly do that uh, by not using uh, the uh, 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 WAN connection and just using the uh, switch ports. Usually they're going to have four switch ports on. Many include security features uh, to specify which wireless devices can make connections to the wired network. We're going to uh, look at a little bit about that. SSID is service set identifier. What we're basically talking about here is the uh, name of the network that we're connecting to. Uh, 
uh, 32-bit alphanumeric identifies the WAP and all the devices connected to it. Uh, the wireless client device must provide the SSID in order to connect to the WAP. Uh, the SSID functions as a sort of a password for the wireless security. The SSID functions as a, this is the network that I want to connect to. You can turn it off if you don't want to broadcast it and that then that we're going to look at that uh, that little problem and that's one of the things that we're going to do there uh, can I accept the the uh, default ssid or specify an ssid uh, to i guess to uh, more clearly identify the, the device and this one here company a company b we might have the uh, uh, production uh, wireless we may have the uh, break room uh, we might have uh, uh, third floor or whatever so you can make the SSID be whatever it wants to be uh, I've always thought one for home would be something like get your virus here something like that uh, to uh, discourage people you can turn it off but if we're if you do turn it off somebody that's dedicated to get onto your network is going to find the SSID anyway they, you know in, in the sniffing software available in Linux uh, to do wireless uh, hacking. The SSID, even though it's not broadcast, it clearly is still embedded in the uh, in the data packet. We have two things, port triggering and port forwarding. Uh, port triggering is if, and this is down here, if you had playing a game, for instance, uh, and this one says a service name, fun game, uh, service user, anybody, uh, service type the trigger port when we use the port for that game it may need other ports in order to get the information uh, through the device and what the trigger would do would then be to open the inbound connections FTP is one that's one that uh, that's not a game but FTP uses uh, port 20 and port 21 so when you start the one it it can open when you initiate the connection it can open the uh, data transfer port port forwarding moves traffic from one network port to the other that's the one that we were talking about and it, it essentially winds up being uh, something very similar to a, uh, uh, a static NAT so but what we would have here we have a device a device back here with with maybe running port 80 so that when we come with a web request to the external uh, address on this router to port 80 it will forward that to a particular internal IP address on port 80 that's basically the way that the DMZ works on the uh, on the home routers is that it uses port forwarding to forward the web information and, that, and usually they support natively web application a web server in the DMZ will forward it to whatever uh, computer we put in as the uh, DMZ machine port forwarding firewall receives a request for communication from the internet to a specific computer and port will be allowed and forwarded to that computer and then port triggering opens a port uh, when a PC on the uh, network initiates communication through another port the game that okay we initiate the game on port 888 eight, eight, and then we also need 512, 513 and 514 open they will automatically be opened uh, for the game. Uh, tips when using the port forwarding and triggering uh, at least a static IP address from your ISP uh, static is always good because it doesn't change IP addresses DHCP IP addresses tend to be persistent. They don't change very much. The reason is we talked about DHCP and that it gives us the address when we have and we have a lease. When the lease gets 50% completed, when we're at 50% of the lease time, the device will request a renewal of that IP address. And unless there's a reason not to, the DHCP server will renew it. So the IP addresses tend to stay the same unless the uh, provider needs to uh, to change the uh, the range around, and that's happened a couple of times. They've changed the entire uh, IP range on the networks that I've been on. 
uh, for port forwarding to work, your computer on your network must have a static address, or you must know the address and provide it to the uh, to the users. Port triggering stops sending data. Uh, the router might close the trigger port before the communication is complete. Uh, use port forwarding your computer and network are more vulnerable because now we're allowing uh, connections from the untrusted network, the internet, into our trusted network, our private network external users directly into it. Uh, DMZ we talked about a little bit, a computer or network that is protected by a firewall. Uh, it allows anybody to get to specific services. The, mo the one that we usually think about there is going to be the web service. Uh, content uh, filtering and, and uh, parental controls uh, normally provide a way for parents to limit content of the computers on the local network what they can do when they can't do it. Uh, we got a friend that kids sometimes get up in the middle of the night and start their Xbox game. What they want to do, and I guess we're going to do, I don't know. You never know with people is to uh, go into parental controls and turn the Xbox off at 11, 1130, whatever time you want it to go off and don't let it come back on until 8 o'clock in the morning. Similar to what I described that I did with a proxy server can apply it to specific computers, users, websites, categories of websites, uh, keywords, services, time of day, day of week, and these are all things that you can do with a uh, proxy server also. Router settings, and these are the settings that we're going to look at in this simulator here in a minute, but the basics, uh, secure the router or the access point <clears throat> administration interface, uh, change the default password and usernames, a lot of people don't do that. And we have you know a limited number like password, password, admin, admin, password, admin, admin, and admin, and nothing uh, are the basic ones. Disable remote administration, and that probably going to be disabled by default. Remote administration allows somebody to manage your router from the internet. Uh, you may need to do it if you've got a, a parent that doesn't do it very well. Uh, you may want to enable remote administration, look up your IP address, and put it in because, again, it's persistent. It may change. It may not change, but you can use the uh, Change the default SNMP parameters. Upgrade the firmware if necessary, and, and that's one that, yeah, you may need to do it. See if it's actually going to help you before you do it because there is risk, not a great deal of risk, although I told you I had a bad experience with it. Uh, Mac filtering, uh, Mac, remember the Mac address was the layer 2 address, the permanent address uh, that's assigned to the NICs. What we can do is filter Mac addresses as either allowed or denied. Uh, we, early on in our wireless, before we had uh, enterprise level capability, we would put in the MAC addresses of those devices that were allowed on the wireless network. Change the default channel. We talked about that. You want to get away from everybody else. Uh, configure DHCP or disable it and enter static addresses so it can run as a DHCP server also. Update firmware updates uh, come from the manufacturer. Updates from other sources to change it. Uh, there are some open source firmwares for some link sys uh, access points. Uh, universal plug and play uh, enables the routers uh, to discover Wi-Fi enabled devices more easily. Uh, it is can cause security issues because applications can, applications can make changes to the routers. So when we do that, we're going to get into uh, security issues. But a universal plug and play is something that's been around for a while. A uh, number of people recommend that you disable it. Don't use it. It can simplify things, but it can create security issues also. Before we, or actually, let's let me see where we are. Maybe we just go ahead and finish it up and then do that. Uh, do that now. Let's let's go ahead and look at this one I got the one that they said to do and I put it in the uh, document that has the list here so we have this thing and I'm gonna this has got a warning message here I'm gonna say okay when I get here I give select the language 
internet connection type. Uh, we can do that a static IP, uh, layer 2 tunneling protocol, whatever we're going to use. Typically, it's going to be DHCP. The ISP is going to give us our public IP address. Host name uh, can go in here, a domain name if we have one, the uh, maximum transmission unit, the TCP. How big can the uh, TCP uh, uh, segment be? Uh, IP address. This is the internal IP address of this thing, and then the, the router name. DHCP server enabled or disabled, uh, and then the starting IP address, uh, the maximum number of users that are, are available in it. DNS server goes in here, so we have the IP address range uh, 100. We said we have 50, so 100 to 149. The basic configurations on this thing. I'm going to open up my instructions here. People in the in the nearby should not be able to see the wireless network. So we want to go to the wireless here, and this this has got uh, Wi-Fi protected set up and uh, configured. We'll go into a manual here. We're going to uh, connect the network mode here. It says mixed. We could have a mix says we can use any of these things. Uh, B and G, B only, G only, or N only, depending on how you want to configure it. The BG issue becomes that if we have it mixed and probably won't see any B nicks around, and for some reason uh, we get a B network, it's going to degrade everybody too because even though they're backward compatible, they use different processes, it's going to bring us back to the B standard. And then the channel width we can pick here, channel auto, or we can go in and pick the channel, 1, 6, and 11. Just pick 11 for the heck of it. SSID broadcast. And the first thing it says here, people in nearby apartments should not be able to see the wireless network. So we're going to turn off the SSID. Uh, your setting will disable Wi-Fi protected setup. Yeah, we will continue with that. We want to disable that. Uh, the network name, the SSID, it told us what to use, and we were supposed to use SOHO1. SOHO1. And the SSID is case sensitive because now that we've turned it off on the computers that we're connecting to, we'll have to specify what the uh, uh, what the SSID is so that it can connect to that particular network. Use the most secure authentication. So wireless security is currently disabled. Yeah, because we want to enable it. Wait a minute. Wi-Fi protected setup. Let's go to wireless security. We we want to let's say prevent as they use the most secure authentication. So that's going to be and it says that a radius server is not available. If a radius server were available, we would use enterprise mode, but we'll have to use WPA2 personal, which is going to use a pre-shared key. So the pass passphrase would be, and they don't tell us what to put in. Yeah, they do too. For the password, it's also going to be so ho one. So we have now done that. The the last thing I guess I could save settings oh and then I didn't have a you're gonna have to set up their uh, just gonna put in a bunch of junk here your settings have been successfully saved I'll never be able to remember that obviously let's go back to it, yeah I forgot to I didn't save these. So we need to save those. Network mode, we'll leave it mixed. The SSID, we want it to be so one. So it's successfully saved. Let's go back here to manual. So that one looks okay. Wireless security, we wanted WPA2 personal. Just because I saved those. I'm just putting something in so it will actually save it. We'll have the information there. Uh, access policy, if we wanted to limit uh, 
this is parental controls, a URL, restrict internet access. Uh, we can enable it. I think security, wireless, um, um, yeah, wireless Mac filtering because the other thing it said was to prevent the device with the Mac address from connecting. So we will enable this and we will prevent and I'll type it in, but you would type in the MAC address that you would that you didn't want on your network. So you're going to have some configurations like that, I'm sure, on the uh, uh, on the uh, test itself. You can practice this. Lots of simulators are available uh, to do that with. Common network issues: no connectivity or connections lost. Uh, in wireless, a number of things can cause that. Uh, we we can have a, a microwave one thing fluorescent lights will affect it uh, just general noise around distance going through walls a wireless telephone not a cell phone but a wireless telephone that works at the 2.4 frequency uh, game controllers somebody close to us on the same channel that we're on can cause all of those issues. No connectivity, maybe we got the wrong uh, the SSID, maybe uh, we forgot the password. Uh, slow transfer speeds, uh, distance away from the network can affect those. So a, a number of things that we can do there. I think that, yeah, I've got individual slides on those. I thought I did. No connectivity. An indication of physical problem, loose cable, defective adapter, uh, check for missing incorrect IP addresses. Uh, if the address is manually configured to be a, a data entry area, error or reconfigure the connection. If it's DHCP, that means that everybody's probably on this wrong network. Uh, slow speeds, high traffic, lots of collisions. In wireless, somebody may be downloading a movie because they get uh, the connection, they uh, get on the connection and they take most of the bandwidth on those. So and it's the same same way on a wire, but it's not as noticeable as it is on a wireless. Local connectivity, but no internet connection. Default gateway address may be a, an issue. The default gateway is the router that you go to to get out of your network. If you don't have a default gateway, you can only communicate on the local network. Uh, limited connectivity, uh, limited, limited connections to resource, uh, can be due to insufficient permissions or unavailable target network resource. Make sure that the printer or server is running and connected to the network. Check to make sure that the uh, user has the appropriate permissions. Can I do that? Can I actually print? Do I have the permission to, to, to print to the device? IP conflict, uh, connection by IP address, uh, but not by name can be an indication of a DNS uh, configuration, which is a little bit different than IP conflict. IP conflict to me is two devices have the same IP address. You'll get a warning that says that there's an IP uh, address conflict, and it usually is going to uh, shut down the NICs or the networking on both of the devices. Windows will anyway. Intermittent connectivity, electrical noise ambient noise, high tension power lines, electric motors, uh, electrical heating elements may be there, fluorescent lights, neon, uh, high intensity discharges, uh, lights produce a large amount of electrical noise, lights that produce that, and that, that's what those would be fluorescents, uh, transformers, ballast, lots of things can cause the intermediate, uh, intermittent connectivity. Low RF signals, uh, low could mean that there's an issue with the access point. Some access points, some of the higher end access points allow you to actually manage uh, the power out. The ones that we buy at home usually are, are a fixed power, but uh, power out, may, we may have set it too low. Uh, access point may have failed, uh, be misconfigured. Uh, for example, if a Mac filtering is enabled at the access point, then the PC may not be able uh, to connect to it. Obviously, wouldn't be able to, otherwise it wouldn't uh, do us any good. A PIPA, 
uh, link local address, a people automatic IP addressing uh, enabled on Windows computers. Uh, it can be disabled in the registry. Uh, it's a, a commonly used as a backup uh, to IP addressing service to DHCP. If DHCP isn't available, then you'll get the the uh, PIPA address, which is the 169.254. something. something with a 255.255.0.0 subnet mask and no default gateway. SSID not found. Uh, does not detect the SSID, may be uh, difficult to connect. You have to specify it. It is case sensitive. The one that we just configured wouldn't be available because we turned it on. Uh, connection to the uh, connection to wireless devices, the adapter may be damaged or its drivers corrupted. Uh, also make sure that the connecting device is actually within range of the uh, wireless signal. Uh, and, and the uh, PIPA address assigned so that it's connecting the internet is not allowed uh, with those. These are some tools that are available. Uh, and I guess it take a couple of minutes here and look at a couple of, of them in the command prompt. So let's stretch this out where we can still see what the commands are. Uh, these are Windows commands. IP config shows us the IP configuration on the device. And this is the Ethernet adapter, which is the one that I'm using. Uh, the connection DNS specific, it, home is the name of the network. IPv6 address, link local address IPv6, and link local addresses for IPv6 always start with FE80. Uh, IP address 192.168 private IP address here, subnet mask 255.255.255.0, which means that it is a, a class C network address, private IP address. Default gateway for both the uh, IPv6 and the IPv4 addresses, depending on which protocol it decides to use. Ping is going to check network connectivity. If we ping, uh, yahoo.com pine is not you know ping yahoo.com then we get a response say okay the, the the sites up the resource is up ns lookup checks dns checks a dns server to be sure that it is working i don't have one uh, to, to look at right now so that we can go look and see that we're actually being able to resolve addresses through it. Trace route, tracer T. You got to spell them right though. Goes router to router to get from point A to point B. They also have visual trace routes which are a lot more interesting than just looking at the trace route. If it fails, some some routers are configured to not answer, and that may be what's happening here, or we may be at the end. Trace complete. This says that we actually got there. This one timed out. This router doesn't respond. So when we look at those out there, netstat, and you can try all of these things on your machine. This is the these are the connections. TCP 127.001 is me, and then the port numbers. The name of this device, the foreign address, this is the name of the device. We have established connections. It will show you what is connected on to your machine. So NetStat uh, is kind of an interesting thing to do. NBTStat uh, is, a, is a NetBIOS thing. Net, NetDOM are, are Windows specific things. Software, network troubleshooters, Wi-Fi locators are, are all utilities uh, that you might use. Linux does the same thing, a little bit different commands instead of tracer T, trace route. It uses the trace route spelled out. Ping is still the same. ARP is still the same. We looked at ARP the other night, the uh, 
uh, association relationship between the uh, IP address and the MAC address. Instead of using IP config, it uses IF config interface uh, configuration to, to look at the IP information on it. I think we did these tools last night, the cable tester to test cables here uh, for that we got the wires in the right place, that we have connectivity with it. The loopback plug to check to test a uh, NIC with it connects the uh, transmit portion of the transceiver to the receive portion of the transceiver sends a signal around in a loop to be sure that the uh, NIC is working. Punch down tool uh, we used to uh, punch down the wires uh, and it cut the wires at the same time when we did a, 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 a wiring a, a wiring block on a machine. The tone generator generated a tone on the wire and then we used the receiver to find specific wires in the uh, in the uh, network in the building. Crimpers we used to make uh, RJ45 with the different connectors have the different size crimpers and the one that's shown here has three different sizes you can buy them at a hardware store, wire strippers uh, to strip the wires with, and then a, the wireless locator to locate the wireless devices. And, and there is a there is a uh, software that you can install on these things uh, called LoJack. You can LoJack uh, the device in order to find it. So that are there questions?